This podcast contains discussions of child abuse, sexual repression and sexual abuse, suicide, racism, misogyny, PTSD and PTSD symptoms, and spiritual oppression and abuse, including guilt, shame, and fear. In most episodes, we will be mentioning some of these concepts in a general way without any graphic detail. If any of these topics or other triggering topics will be mentioned in great detail, we will let you know at the beginning of each individual episode, as well as in the show notes for that episode. Welcome back to the Leaving Eden podcast. I am feeling great. I am feeling healthy. I am feeling fancy. I am feeling fresh. Oh, so fresh. Oh, so clean. Does, I'm sorry. Does this have to do with the, the spring? Is that what we're referencing here? Yes, because okay. the spring, <laughs> this spring is a time of cleaning. <laughs> well, if you were ever IFB, you would know that actually spring is the time for programs. Yes, yes, yes. This is the time for spring programs, and the Leaving Eden podcast is no exception. My name is Gabriel Hakoen, and I am here with my co-host, Sadie Carpenter, and we are here to talk about Sadie's life in the independent fundamental Baptist cult. We are here to warn people about the dangers of this cult, other cults, and the real and present threat that groups like this pose to society as a whole. We seek to promote freedom of mind freedom of thought, and freedom of religion. And so, without further ado, let's get into these things. Let's get into spring programs. But before we do that, I have to ask Sadie one question. Yes. What is a spring program? Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> you so, thought it was going somewhere else with it. I have no idea what it is. It's just something that you brought up. It, it's just words. I feel like spring program, it's one of those things like, um, like soul winning or bus calling. Uh, it's it's such a piece of jargon that I say, oh, do you know about this thing? And you're like, what the heck is that? Yeah. So the spring program is a series of special Sundays, and it's almost always in March, uh, could also be April, where IFB churches push even harder than normal to have visitors come to church and to convert those visitors into new members. So it is church programming, mm -hmm. but it's in the spring. Yep. Spring program. Yep. Got it. Yep. That's all you need to know. We're done with our episode. <laughs> that's all I need to. Okay, that's it. Okay. <laughs> this has been the Leaving Eden podcast. There's nothing else to talk about here. Um, <laughs> nope, that's it. <laughs> no, so when I sat down to outline this episode, um, I wanted to kind of get my thoughts in order because this is one, this is not an episode that can be written chronologically. This is something like it's concept, it's a concept. Uh, and I sat down to try to, to get an outline together and I, found out very quickly that a spring program is so hard to describe. And I'm definitely blaming about 50% of that to the fact that I've completely blocked out a large subset of traumatic memories from childhood. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, this one does, does have some, this one has some childhood trauma, like the kind that I can laugh about now. Uh, it's sprinkled throughout this. <laughs> But okay. I think the other half of my difficulty in providing you with a with a good description comes from the fact that this is maybe one of the most niche IFB things of all niche IFB things. And it, it feels really difficult to translate something from so deep within that world into our current reality. I feel like I'm trying to describe something from another dimension. So like if you were uh, like a regular Christian um, or if you were a Catholic or if you were, a, um, I don't know, like a, if you were a Lutheran or you were a, a Methodist or something, you would have no idea what a spring program was. Most likely not. No, not unless someone from your church had 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 some contact with somebody from an IFB church and the concept had been passed to you from within the IFB. Interesting. So this is like, even if you were a Southern Baptist or something, would you know what a spring program was? 
So the Southern Baptist might do something called like a, an individual SBC church might do something that they would call a spring program, but it would not be the same thing. It wouldn't be defining that the, the, the term would be used in a different way. Okay. So like nobody does it the way the IFB does it except for the IFB. So this is really some weird cult right here. Right. And it's it's not only that it's just the IFB, it's pretty much just the IFB f- subset that followed Jack Hiles. Right. OK, because every like Hiles camp ministry, basically every IFB church where their pastor graduated from Hiles Anderson is basically intended to be a clone, like mm-hmm. a facsimile of First Baptist Church of Hammond. Yes, they all went very much by the book. And when I say by the book, I mean by the literal book, uh, the book being the Hiles Church Manual, which is the book that Hiles wrote about exactly how to run a church. (laughs) So definitely by the book. So to understand where the concept of the spring program came from or how Hiles made it what it was, what it is, you'd have to look back at the social changes and the, the social pressures that allowed Jack Hiles to be the person that he was to begin with. In the Lester Roloff episode and in other episodes, we talked about evangelists. So throughout the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, evangelists would rent out huge civic auditoriums and they would travel around and preach. And their main goal was to have people get saved and then also to get people who were already saved to become better Christians. And back in those days, people would go to revival meetings, I guess just because they were bored We are talking about back before most families had a television set, so I guess people just did what they could for entertainment, and Christianity was so prevalent in the United States that it wasn't seen as odd to just go to a revival meeting. So it was like the revivals that we saw in, like, Sheffy, but, like, 80 years later. Yes. This is just, like, an updated, like, modern, or or, I, I wouldn't say modern, but, like, 20s and 30s version of that. Yes, it's a it's a transition point between that and Christian conferences now, like pastor school or youth conference. Okay, okay, that makes perfect sense to me. Right, like these these things are all a progression of things that are related. Well, these people who went to revival meetings, they would get converted by these really fire and brimstone preachers. So then they tended to go to more fire and brimstone churches when they became churchgoers. So these people would end up in Southern Baptist churches uh, before the 1950s when the Southern Baptists, quote unquote, went liberal and stopped, you know, yelling so much and telling people they were going to hell. And they could also end up in churches like IFB churches that were more fire and brimstone because that's who the that's what the preacher who converted them was like. What I found out researching this episode is that the idea of the spring program actually comes from these revival meetings because these revival evangelists wanted to have more and more people come to their meetings. And this could be for an altruistic reason, like they really believed that they were helping people go to heaven and they wanted more people to get saved so they could go to heaven. Right. Like if you believe in the core of your body that the number one thing that somebody needs to do in their life is get saved by Jesus, you know, you want to get it like you see it as the best thing that you can do to get as many people through those doors as possible. Right. So this could have been, you know, some of these preachers could have been working from really pure intentions. Um, Oh, I don't doubt it. Others of them could have been working from the idea that the more people, the bigger the offering and the more money (laughs) that they get. And, you know, there's no there's no real way of knowing who was who this far after the fact. But either way, as as the popularity of these revival meetings, so with the rise of prosperity in the 1950s, uh, people having TVs, people, the, the beginnings of primetime television, <laughs> uh, you know, people stayed home and didn't go to evangelistic services. There was a shift culturally after World War II. So these evangelists needed better PR to get people to come to their evangelistic services because whether they were doing it for the salvations or for the money, they still needed more people either way. So what they started doing is having contests to attract more people. So at the beginning, they would have 
like family member night and they would give a prize like a new bible or it could be a cash prize or other types of prizes they but they would give a prize to the person who brought the most family members to the revival service interesting that doesn't seem that weird though no like it, that that is a pretty norm that makes sense if you're understanding like the cultural context of what's going on although i'm i'm trying to imagine how annoying it would be if you had one like culty brainwashed family member just begging and haranguing everybody in the family to come to their cult meeting so that they can win a <laughs> stupid prize. That is what a lot of people still go through every spring if they have oh. IFB family members. <laughs> so another one of these contests or promotions, they might have a pack a pew night. So a prize would go to whoever could get the most people into, you know, you'd get assigned a pew and whoever could get the most people into their pew would win. Oh, I mean, my hips hurt just thinking about them all being jammed up, like being jammed up against some old ladies, like bony pelvis, but also like afraid that you're just going to like move wrong and then just like just shatter all of the bones in her leg. She's going to need a hip replacement. Oh, I believe I've been one of 20 people in a standard pew that's meant to fit eight people. It's like that 70s thing, you know, what? where where people would see how many people they could get into a phone booth or into a VW or whatever. Okay, but to be fair, eight IFB church members are probably going to be the same width as 20 normal people. Yeah, I've been one of 20 IFB <laughs> church members in a standard size pew. <laughs> I'm no, sorry. We're, we're that... going to get to that. <laughs> as time went on, these contests became more and more outlandish. So you were saying that that family member night doesn't seem that weird. And you're right, it doesn't. But what started with that became more juvenile promotions, um, stuff that still wasn't necessarily weird, but was a little bit more, I don't know, I think juvenile is the best word, um, like banana split night. So everybody who came was given a free banana split after the preaching was done. Okay, that's totally on brand, though, for the IFB to be bribing people with food. But this progressed past that into some pretty crazy stunts to promote these meetings. So things like having a daredevil, like literally an evil Knievel type dude out in the parking lot to jump his motorcycle off of things after the service. Oh, God. Yeah. So this like really got out of hand over like it started (laughs) with bring all your family to this revival meeting and we'll give you a new Bible. And then it just like snowballed into come to church. We're going to have a guy jumping over 14 buses with his motorcycle. That Wow. Yeah, it definitely that... got off the rails at some point. <laughs> like if you were one of if you're like a motorcycle daredevil kind of guy, like could you make your entire living off of just doing like church services? Like you're like, I am a Christian motorcycle bus jump daredevil. Oh, if you claim to be a Christian one, you could, but we're going to get to that. Oh God. Uh, yeah, we're going to get to that. So don't steal my thunder. Okay. But the point of all well, of this did it is, Did it work though? We're going to get to that. Okay. The point is that Jack Hiles grew up in Texas. So he grew up with these hyper-evangelistic, hyper-promoted revival meetings being a very real and a very normal part of his life because he grew up in Texas in the middle of the Depression. So like poor people who went to these meetings, that was like, that was him. That was his family. And we've talked before about Jack Hiles and his gift for crowd management, how he seemed to like instinctively understand how to be his own hype man, his own PR man. And a lot of this he may have picked up from these traveling evangelists who literally made a career out of bribing people to come to church. And it did work. So it worked. Yeah, it absolutely worked. Wow. Okay. And he, Hiles would have seen this working for other people. And this is probably where he got the idea. So he took this concept, he ritualized it because... For a man who hated Catholics, that man loved ritual, but he applied it to his church in Hammond. I think I think this was kind of his his pattern of behavior throughout his life. He made a repeatable step by step process out of everything that he did. 
And the ritualized form of these church-related PR stunts that Hiles came up with, he called it spring programs and fall programs. So what he did was he had four or five weeks set aside in the spring and four or five weeks in the fall. Usually it would be in March or April and then in October or November, but it could vary on exactly when you did it. Very often they would set it up where the end of the spring program was Easter Sunday. Uh, A lot of times the end of this fall program would be Thanksgiving or the end of the fall program would be the week of Halloween so they could have a fall festival. But over these four or five weeks, there would be multiple different contests and promotions And it was all in an effort to meet certain church-wide goals. So the goals are almost always based around the number of people saved, the number of people baptized, the number of people visiting the church, or uh, total attendance numbers. It was always something countable, some kind of number-centric numerical goal. So for a smaller church in those four or five weeks, you would have a goal like, we want to see 500 people saved, 50 people baptized, and have a gross attendance of 350 people on the last week of our program. And I think it's important to note as well that these are always stretch goals. The idea is for the pastor to set a goal that is reachable but will take a lot of work. Like someone who's currently running a nine-minute mile that wants to get themselves down to an eight-minute mile. But often pastors will get a little ahead of themselves and they will set goals that are not really attainable. Like uh, someone who's running a nine minute mile who wants to get down to a six minute mile by the end of this month. Ugh. Yeah. So you can get like that they were supposed to set goals that were reachable, but sometimes pastors get a little in their head about what's actually reachable. And these goals are meant to be achieved in a couple different ways. So first there would be church wide goals with church wide rewards. And these were often, again, kind of back to the juvenile thing, like. If the church makes its attendance goal on this particular Sunday, the pastor will take a pie to the face on the platform. I guess it's for the people that are already in the church. But if you're not like, like, I'm not going to go to somebody's church service just to see some guy get a pie in the face. Yeah, but the IFB think you are. Um, the other the, way- I feel like the IFB are like, oh, well, you the people who know the pastor will be motivated to. OK, so it's for right. them. It's not for me. Right. It's a motivation thing. But the other way that these goals were meant to be achieved was by pitting church members head to head against each other in like a Hunger Games type situation in which they competed against each other for points and attempted to win prizes. So this is like the IFB Thunderdome. And so people are getting really into it. Remember when we talked about the Valentine Banquet? Yes. Specifically how... Some churches get the banquet right, and it's actually pretty fun. And then some churches get it wrong, and everybody hates it but feels obligated to do it. Yes. Okay. This is very much the same concept as far as the spring program. Personally, as a kid, I dreaded these contests, but that was because I was a child, and I had no chance of actually winning, and that made me mad because I'm an extremely competitive person. (laughs) Some people got super competitive about these these contests. Some people got too competitive and took it way too seriously. And then some people hated it and like kind of made like a show like they were, oh, yeah, I'm totally participating, but actually didn't do anything because they hated these BS competitions. So this is another like one of those situations, just like the Valentine's Banquet. Like some people hated it. Some people didn't mind it. Some people were jerks and ruined it for other people. So you know what this reminds me of? This is like last week we talked about Jack Hiles and he had this sermon called Duty. <laughs> and Shit. Now you got me started. <laughs> okay. Well, who's the immature one now? <laughs> and it was all, okay, I'm just going to talk past you because Sadie clearly has no maturity, even though she is about to give birth to a child, a literal child. I'm wondering about that child's <laughs> welfare. Um, clearly, uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, he had this sermon called Duty, which was all about, <laughs> which was all about how even if you hate something, you still have an obligation to do it. Yes. And this is just my IFB, like, kid brain talking. 
But the impression that I got growing up was that if you hated something, you had more of an obligation to do it than an obligation than something you liked. So it's like like a bloodless self flagellation situation. Okay, like eating vegetables. The less you enjoy a vegetable, the more likely it is to be good for you. I mean, except for spinach. I've always loved spinach. Big fan of spinach. Okay, see, I th- I feel like though when our parents were growing up, vegetables were all like canned or tinned or like frozen. And then they were all just really gross. So vegetables being gross came like it was kind of like a trope. And you'd see yeah. it on like cartoons. Not Like if somebody offers me like some celery or some cu- – I'll be like, hell yeah, let me get some celery and some cucumbers. I'll dip that uh, in hummus. That sounds delicious. Like food is way better now than it used to be in the 60s and 70s and 80s and even 90s. I'm sorry. We've gotten way <laughs> off track here. I want to get back to talking about the spring program. So – um hypothetically if i were an ifb pastor and i like say i have a small to medium sized ifb church and i feel strongly that my message is not reaching enough people what am i going to do okay so for a small to medium sized church are we assuming that you usually run about like 100 150 people on a normal sunday uh say maybe like a little better than that maybe like 200 okay is that including bus kids i let's I say don't know. Let's say you run 200, so you've got 125 in Sunday morning service and 75 bus kids. Um, okay. Is is that like normal or is that – That is that's not pretty small. Good. Yeah. That's that's like medium for an IFB church. There are so, okay. So I'm doing pretty well. Yeah. Like many, many IFB churches run like 30 or 40 people on a good day. Oh, okay. So that's yeah. why you got that's why the pastors are so broke because they don't have any tithe money because they don't have enough people. Okay. Because that makes like the, sense. Yeah, yeah, talk about like the bottom falling out of your your like money making scheme as a church. That's there's there's no money. Yeah. There just there's nothing. Yeah. Right, cuz like nobody wants to join a church where women can't wear pants and they can't watch TV. Right. But also, um, one other quick correction. It doesn't matter if you think your message is reaching enough people or not, because if you went to Hiles Anderson, you have been completely conditioned to do the spring program and fall program every single year. So it's not really an optional like, oh, I think I'll do one this year. It's like you do one because that's what you do. Okay. So say I'm an IFP pastor and I see myself as a disciple of the late great Jack Hiles, and I was required to do a spring program membership drive for my own church. Mm -hmm. So yeah, walk me through this. What am I doing here? So you are going to want to create a four to five week program of different promotions for each week of those four or five weeks to get people to come to church and get them to bring visitors. And then you're going to incentivize people Not just with uh, fun-themed Sundays, but also with a contest that promises fantastic prizes to the church member or church members who win. Okay. I mean, that actually does sound kind of incentivizing, though. So what kind of prizes are we talking about here? Is this going to be like Price is Right? Is somebody from the church going home with a jet ski? Some churches do give away new cars. Um, A good friend of mine in college drove a car for years that she won in a church promotion. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. uh, A jet ski is totally not out of the question. Um, Bitching. Yeah. Um, Appliances would also like other like prices, right? Type prizes like appliances or vacations or whatever. Not impossible. Uh, large amounts of cash can occasionally be a prize. First Baptist Church of Hammond was known for giving, like, having thousand dollar prizes or giving out hundred dollar bills as part of these things. Ooh, yeah. I mean, you know what this? It, what I'm envisioning right here, though. Yeah. You know, okay. You know those TV ads where they're like Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Come, like, it, instead of it being like the monster truck jam, it's like come down to First Baptist Church of Hammond, and you could come home with a brand new ATV and paintball gun. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, you're not totally wrong. It can be. I never known a church to run ad like TV ads for it. Uh, but it really, I mean, I've known churches that ran TV ads, just not for the spring program. It it really can be very much like that. 
Uh, I'm glad you mentioned guns because that is definitely also a thing that people give away. Like an AK-47? Yeah. You can get like an AK, you can get like an M- a, a, a AR-15 or something. Yeah. But also like... So it wow. could be like really great prizes or or like really expensive prizes. I mean, if you're into guns, that would be a cool prize. I mean, yeah, I mean, I have a friend who is not religious but is into guns, and I'm pretty sure he would go uh, yeah. to the church. I, I don't like that. those those guns aren't cheap. Like what? What's an AR-15? Like a thousand bucks? I was gonna say fifteen hundred, but I could be totally off. Yeah, I mean, they, somebody will tell us. Yeah, somebody somebody who listens to this show also likes guns and would tell us how much yeah. those things cost. Somebody will let us know. Yeah. But okay, so it could be really, really good prizes. But there's like a dark side to this because okay, you've worked retail. I'm sure there's been at some point like where you were offered a pizza party if you met a sales goal, and then you met the sales goal and the manager brought like two pizzas for ten people and the pizzas were already cold and there was like so much grease and the soda was flat and then you took a ten minute break to eat the pizza that they got you for the pizza party and then they took that out of your check. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Okay, so it's, yeah, for the spring program, like you might win a jet ski or you might win like the grand prize might be – Something that's like not that cool, but it's pretty nice, like dinner out with a pastor and his wife or a brand new, like expensive leather bound Bible. Something that's not not a terrible prize, but it's a lot less likely to tempt you to go on one of those evil weekend vacations. Right. Because if you have a jet ski, now you got to go to the lake. Right. Um, and you might go on the weekend, which is the equivalent of a soldier showing up to a different camp or something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I personally prefer the jet ski though to uh i mean like as nice as dinner at the ponderosa buffet with the pastor might be (laughs) yeah Uh, i mean at my church going up i think i remember them taking people to ruth's chris so definitely a few a few dozen steps above ponderosa okay so that's like an actually nice restaurant though yeah, like that's like a, I mean, but that's my church. The church that I went to, you have to remember, my dad was my pastor, and my dad is a, a step above most IFB people in terms of having a brain. Yeah. And, and you know, a sense of class and style and, and sophistication. <laughs> yes. Taste. Quite. Taste. So I'm sure there are a lot of churches where this dinner out with a pastor and his wife is like, I don't know, crappy chain restaurant or, or Ponderosa. <laughs> I've ste- I've eaten at a steakhouse like twice in my life. It's it, I mean, you know, growing up, my family like my family just we didn't eat a lot of meat, so oh, that's you not didn't the time. Eat yeah, meat, that's why. Yeah, right. I mean, the, you know, dinner out at like a steak like that's that's an occasion, you know. Even right, if it's you like an actually a a nice prize. Yeah, that's like a uh for a lot of people I know that's like a once a year type deal that you do, you know. You're not going to go to the steakhouse all the time because, you know, yeah, that's Yeah, like so we typically it's so horribly between expensive. my birthday, Jonathan's birthday and our anniversary, we'll go to an expensive restaurant for one of those three. Yeah. Depending on, like depending on who has a milestone birthday or whose birthday we're in Vegas for or whatever. So that is actually like a really nice prize that somebody might want. And you know what? If you are an IFB church member, you would actually probably want to spend a lot of time with your pastor. And, you know, getting in with your like having a one on one dinner with your pastor. That's a big deal. It really that is. is a, that is a big deal. OK, so if you're if you're a member of this. Cult, OK, so that would actually be like a pretty good prize that you could win. Right. It's, it's not a, a nice key, but it's a prize. You know, think a nice meal with somebody who you really admire. That's what you're winning right here. That sounds like a great time. Yeah, especially if your pastor is more like a, a celebrity pastor. If you have a, a larger church, you would never, ever otherwise have the chance to have dinner with somebody like Jack Hiles. No. So that's pretty special. Yeah, that is that is pretty special. Okay. And like, so they win, how do they win this? So do you just get like the most people to come to church with you or or what? So these contests can be as simple as like whoever brings the most visitors over the four weeks period, or they can have a lot of complicated rules, but the programs are always about increasing attendance. So it's always about getting to a certain numerical milestone, either of people saved or people coming to church so that your pastor can say, I had X number of people saved, 
or X number of people in church so that he can look good in front of his other pastor buddies. So if you're a pastor and maybe, you know, you're falling behind a little bit um, and you might be getting a little bit desperate because, you know, uh, Pastor Joe Smith from First Baptist Church of the next town over, he's beaten you in soul winning numbers and spring program numbers the last three years. So you're going to try to make your program even more and more and more enticing. But is is that possibly going to happen by putting more pressure on the parishioners that you've got? Yes, it it is definitely going to put a lot of pressure on your church members, um, a lot of time constraints on them. Before I get into the details of that, though, I want to talk about the clear hypocrisy in the way that most of these contests are run. Okay, so how how does how does it work? Well, I think the most common way of scoring these contests is to have a points system. Usually, I think the most common thing is each person that you see saved, like people who get saved when you're out soul winning or if you witness to somebody in the grocery store or whatever. You're witnessing to people in the grocery store? Been there, done that so many Uh, times. (laughs) You just like literally strike up a conversation with the cashier and ask them if they want to get saved. So you know how if you're in like a multi-level marketing thing, they teach you how to like compliment people strategically so you can get in a conversation with them that like feels organic and no then, okay <laughs> i've never been in the multi-level marketing thing anybody who ever has knows what i'm talking about uh the ifb will teach you like tactics like that for like striking up a conversation with people where it feels less weird but anyway if you, uh, you get- <laughs> it's still gonna feel fucking weird dude <laughs> We're going to talk about this concept. (laughs) Stop getting ahead of me. (laughs) So uh, the more people you see saved, the more points you get because each person is worth one point. And then usually the way these contests are scored, if you get that person to come to church with you, that's worth like five points. And then if that person who got saved and came to church with you, if they get baptized, that's worth five more points. Okay, but that makes sense because if you get baptized, that's more commitment and that means more points. Right. So it does make sense in a way, but the issue is that these people, the IFB will say that they theologically believe that getting saved is the most important thing that can ever happen to you and that you don't ever have to go to a church or get baptized in order to go to heaven. Their specific doctrines about baptism are so important to them that they call themselves Baptist. But because of the way these points are broken down, okay, if I have 49 people get saved over the course of the spring program, but you get five people to come to church and get baptized, you still win the spring program. Even though I had 49 people make the most important decision of their life ever. Okay, I still just do not understand any of this because if getting saved means that you go to heaven then there is literally zero motivation to live by all of these stupid rules, though, and to keep going to church. Yeah, but if you're not willing to give up your movies and your pop music and your beer for Jesus, were you ever really saved to begin with? Because if you're really saved, wouldn't you like have the Holy Spirit in your heart and that would make you just voluntarily want to give up all those things? So, Sadie, did you see the Firefest documentary? I saw both the Netflix and the Hulu ones. So just because a guy is willing to do what he's got to do to get the water to the people doesn't mean that he wanted to, but that Mm -hmm. doesn't make him any less of a hero. That's okay. That's true. I'm still trying to figure out how to explain salvation doctrines to you. The IFB has an answer for everything, but sometimes it's just so convoluted and there are like four layers of things that you have to understand before you can understand the end of the sentence. So I I don't know how to, I'll eventually figure out how to explain it to you. (laughs) But if you were really saved, maybe you would understand why. (laughs) I guess I'll never know. Yeah, I think I'm just like, I'm super bitter about this, I think, because as I've said before, I was always really good at getting people to pray a prayer with me and get saved, but I was never able to convert that, like turn that over into people coming to church or people getting baptized, no matter how much I tried, no matter how much I begged and pleaded, like people to come to church with me. 
Like I could get anybody to pray a prayer with me and get saved. I was super good at that. But I could not get people to come to church with me. I guess like I didn't have family members in the area who weren't IFB who I could like drag out for family day. I didn't have coworkers to bribe. I didn't I went to IFB school, so I had to start from zero. So I didn't have anybody that I already knew to invite. I had to meet a stranger and convince them to come to church with me or meet a stranger who was a kid and convince their parents into letting them come to church with me. So it it, did, it just didn't happen for me. And so I was totally screwed out of winning anything in these programs. So you're not mad at the IFB for being hypocrites. You're mad that your family never got to take home that Chrysler PT Cruiser convertible. Um, my church wasn't the type to give away cars, but I will tell you what I was actually mad about. Okay. Yeah. Tell me. Okay. Uh, this is the childhood trauma moment of today's episode. Uh, oh. This one's pretty. This was this was like one of my worst days as a kid. I don't know if it's going to translate to being sad for everybody else or if it's just me. Uh, so this first, I want a well, little more background on the spring program. This ritual of having the spring program and fall program, it's become such a thing that you don't just have the church-wide contest. There's also a contest for every Sunday school class, and they give out prizes in your Sunday school class. And there's a contest for junior church, and they give out prizes in junior church. And there's a contest on every bus route, and they give out prizes on the bus route. So if I bring a visitor to church, I can count that towards the church-wide spring program contest where I'm trying to win a jet ski or dinner with the pastor or whatever I'm trying to win. But I can also count that same visitor towards my Sunday school class as well. And in my Sunday school class, maybe my teacher's giving out one of those giant Hershey, like five pound Hershey candy bars for the grand prize. And then I can also take that same visitor and count it towards the junior church spring program where my super cool junior church teacher is going to take the top three winners to Chuck E. Cheese. So if I have a Sunday during the spring program where I end up bringing a whole bunch of people to church, I am going to smoke my competition. So Mm. I'm going to go home at the end of that night. I'm going to get the grand prize. I'm also going to win a five pound Hershey bar and I'm going to Chuck E. Cheese next week because you can triple, double, triple count those visitors towards all of these different contests that you're simultaneously competing in. Okay. So how old are you at this point? So the particular story that I'm telling, I would have been either six, just turned six or just turned seven. Okay, so young enough to find Chuck E. Cheese entertaining and not old enough to know that five pounds of Hershey's chocolate is not a prize that you want to win. I don't know why not. I would love five pounds of Hershey chocolate right now. Yeah, but that's not you. That's Chuck. You know what? At time of recording, Chuck barely weighs more than a five pound block of Hershey's chocolate. <laughs> but you're probably right. <laughs> No, so I I remember going out with my mom all day for this particular spring program. And it's Iowa in the winter or early spring. So it's all snow and slush and getting your feet wet and everything else and inviting people to church. We were out on my dad's bus route. So my dad and I were going to come back the next day with the bus and bring people to church. So if people said, if I asked somebody if they wanted to come to church with me and they said yes, I could give them free transportation. So it seemed in my kid brain, like, this is a great deal for these adult people. So I was asking all these people, like, if they wanted to come to church with me on the bus the next day. And I I don't know if people thought I was cute or people felt bad for me because I was out in the snow or what. You were out with, like, your mom? I was out with my mom, yeah. And I was a tiny little child, like, will you come to church with me? And you're thinking, oh, this is a great advantage because, you know, my dad's the pastor. He's got the bus. This is when my dad was an assistant pastor. But yeah, he had the bus. He's got the bus. Okay. Make it super convenient for these people. They they just got to come out of their door the next morning. And get on the bus. And that's it. Get on the bus. Go to church. Okay. That's all we got to do. And I'm the Hershey's chocolate Chuck E. Cheese is mine. Yes. So at the end of the day, I had 14 people and most of them were adults who had promised, promised, promised to come to church with me the next day. So if all of them just come to church with you, how many points is that? So that is 70 points. Worst case scenario, that puts, you're like going strong. You might win win everything. Yeah. Yeah. So 
I had all of these people, I had their names and addresses written down in like my six-year-old handwriting on a piece of paper. And I was ready to like sweep the spring program the next day. And so you envision yourself like hand in hand with your parents, hand in hand with your mom, church doors swung open and an army of newly saved good Christians behind you marching in to onward Christian soldiers. Yep. So in my mind, I was the hero at the end of every sports movie ever. I was already hearing the theme song in my head. I was already yep. going to, I was going to pull off the greatest victory in the history of, stri- of spring programs. And I was raised by like my dad and my grandpa, my, my grandpa being a World War II veteran and my upbringing, even the parts that weren't super controlled by the IFB, my upbringing was extremely focused on integrity and honesty. Like the worst thing you could do in my house growing up was tell a lie. My parents would forgive us. If we got in trouble for other stuff, they would be merciful. But the thing that they would show no mercy on was lying or breaking your word. If you did something bad and then you lied about it, you'd get double the punishment. Like whatever the punish- the normal punishment for what you did was, my parents would double it if you lied about it. They were super, super, super strict on That one thing you do, if you say you're going to do something, you do it no matter what. So at this age, as a little tiny child, I did not have the concept of promising that you would do something and then not doing it. I had literally never considered that an adult would say that they would do something like come to church with me the next day and then not follow through with that. So I'm getting where this is going. So yeah. <laughs> so a lot of these people. So you've got 14 people that promised to come. That yeah. promised. So how many show? You get 10. You get five. Zero. None of them. None of them. Not one of them. Not a single one. Wow. Yeah, and because it's on my dad's bus route, so I was the one. <laughs> so there was like some adult with me, but I was the person going up to every door on my little handwritten list and knocking on the door and trying to wake these people up. What time is it? Is it like, like 7 30 on a Sunday morning? Oh. So I'm realizing. So I would have gotten up at five in the morning for this as a child. Like I was so excited about this. And I, like as the bus drives to each individual address, I'm like knocking on the door and realizing that, like, oh, that person's not going to come. So, like, this dream of winning the spring program is slipping away from me in, like, a very public and very slow manner. Are you crying? Oh, oh my God, yeah. Oh, my God. It's like, this is, like, one of my worst childhood traumas. (laughs) Um, Like, I personally think this is why I was never able to get visitors to come to church with me in my later, like, teenage and early adult IFB years. I think this event damaged my confidence so much and hurt me so deeply that I never believed anyone again when they said that they would come to church with me. Like, did you, okay, so like, did you like get on the bus and you said, I got 14 people to say that they would come? Like, is that what you did? You're like, who else was on the bus with you? Uh, it would have been my my dad and other bus kids that were like regular bus kids that came to church with us all the time. And other bus workers. So were you bragging to the other bus kids? No, because like I was a bus worker. I wasn't a bus kid. Okay. Well, were you bragging to the other bus workers? Yeah. Like not bragging, but just like excited because like this, I wasn't seeing this as like, oh, look how, well, how good I did. Like, look what a good person I am. It was like, oh, "Oh, look, God has blessed me and I'm going to win the spring program. Like it wasn't bragging. It was like excited. Like, these people are going to come to church and learn about Jesus. And so like in your seven-year-old head, what, so like, what do you think? Are you thinking like these people aren't showing up? It's because they're wicked? Is it because uh, you weren't good enough or like because you didn't have enough faith? Or was it because God was trying to teach you a lesson? I don't remember like what I was thinking at the time. I, it certainly could have been any of those things. I was just 100% blindsided because I had never considered that an adult was capable of lying to a child. Did it like, did it ever occur to you though that like if adults could lie to children, then adults at the church could be lying to you too? You know, they could be lying to the whole community? 
No, I don't think it occurred to me. I think I blamed this on the fact that these are worldly adults. Yeah. Okay, okay, that makes it so rather than being like, okay, this is an eye opening experience, this is an experience that sort of like pushed you deeper in instead. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm trying to imagine like, I'm trying to imagine what your life would have been like if you'd have made that connection the other way. Yeah, that's a really interesting thought for sure. Um, have I talked about on the podcast before? I can't remember if I've gone into this on the show or not. How these experiencers are actually very well suited to getting people deeper into the cult group and making them even more willing to stay in the group. Yeah, like so how feeling more rejected by outsiders pushes you further in. I don't think yeah. we've talked about that specifically, but I've like I've definitely heard it talked about before. Like how the act of soul winning isn't actually an effective strategy for getting new members. The purpose is to like maintain greater control over the members you already have. Right. That's exactly it. Like it's it's actually a control tactic and any new members that you get from this practice are just bonus. Um so for people who haven't heard this before, I have to say it on the show because this is I feel like this is important for people to hear. Um, but going out soul winning, going witnessing, being a missionary if you're Mormon, um, there is a reason that these things almost never work to bring in functional adult church members who become part of the church. The reason that you're made to do it and the reason for the extreme focus on it has nothing to do with the actual intention to recruit members. So if you're door-to-door -door soul winning or if you're out uh, witnessing or whatever your church called it or however your church did this thing, you go out and you're in the world. You're not in the church. And in the winter, you're freezing cold. In the summer, you're overheating and you get doors slammed in your face. And once in a while, somebody cusses you out or swings a rake or a baseball bat at you or even pulls a gun on you. Um, you get told all that all of those are things that have happened to you. I've never had someone pull a gun on me. I have seen gunfights go down while out witnessing more than once. <laughs> yes. Um, my dad has had a gun pulled on him. Oof. But you get told that you're wrong all day, and you come back to the church at the end of this soul winning experience, and you're like exhaust exhausted, and you're sad, and you're scared, and you come back and you tell your war stories about how you got a gun pulled on you that day. And you're enveloped in love and praise and you're told how good of a job you did. And the whole point is that you're supposed to feel rejected out in the world. You're supposed to realize how wicked and hateful the world is and then you feel so loved and cared for in the church. And the whole point is that it makes you less likely to leave because you've been reminded of what a terrible place the world is out there. Hey. Gavriel here. If you enjoy the Leaving Eden podcast, head over to our Facebook group, Eden Exodus, where you can talk to other fans, ask us questions, and share memes. That's facebook.com slash Eden Exodus. You can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash Leaving Eden podcast, and you'll get access to extended and uncensored episodes. You can also support our show by recommending it to your family and your friends. The Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. And now, back to the show. The purpose of the spring membership drive is to actually get new members of the church. And if sending your members out door-to-door -door soul winning doesn't work, then what are you supposed to do to get more people to come to your event? Well... Because we live in such a wicked world where people aren't just thrilled with the idea of waking up early on a Sunday to go to church. We have to incentivize them. Look, I'm going to be real right here. You could tell me that three-time gold medal winning Team USA Olympic gymnast, best-selling author, and sexual abuse survivors advocate Ali Raisman was waiting to meet me for brunch and there's bottomless mimosas. And I would not get out of bed at 7 a.m. on a Sunday. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I feel like that's a lie, but okay. Actually, that is a lie. I would meet Allie Raisman for any reason at <laughs> any time, and no matter what I was doing, even if there was a Formula One race on. Wow. See, Call I feel me like, Allie. <laughs> I feel like at this point, you're at this point, you're either going to get a restraining order or you're going to end up married to her. Like, it's, it's going to be one or the other because you're putting out a lot of energy into the universe right now. We can, Okay, look, we cannot deny Allie Raisman 
beautiful, yes. inspiring, yes. Uh, very smart, mm-hmm. very, uh, uh, you know, from what I have, have seen of her and what I have read, a kind hearted, uh, excellent person. So I'm just, I'm just putting, I'm just putting it out there. No, I I see where you're coming from. Like just an overall stellar example of a human being. Absolutely. Uh, A a Semitic queen, if there ever was one. I'm just, I'm just saying that either this, like this amount, you're putting so much energy towards this, like out into the universe. I was in a clubhouse room the other day (laughs) and somebody in there was like, I know Ali Raisman's dad. I'm like, can you set it up? And And she's like, well, maybe I could get you her cousin. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> true story. Wow. Anyway, would you? So, so apparently, her cousin is very nice and very uh, and very pretty. That's what I've heard. I don't know. I don't know any of these. According to the woman who apparently knows her, we, it was we met. You know what? We met in the Jewish geography room in Clubhouse. I was gonna say something about Jewish geography, and you beat me to it. Yeah. So, okay, so you would get out of bed. Everybody on Clubhouse is Jewish somehow. Like, I just followed a bunch of people, and then everybody that I meet in every room is Jewish. Because you have to have invites to get on the app. That's true. We all invited each other. Yeah, that's it. (laughs) Because, like, because I got my invite from, like, one of your jewish friends like from the book club or something right yeah somebody who's a listener to this podcast no it it was my friend it was my friend who works at the jewish federation of greater portland that's what i'm yeah exactly anyway so you would get out of bed at 7 a.m on a sunday for ali raisman and bottomless mimosas yes ali raisman waiting to meet me for and uh, for a deep discussion about uh I don't know, whatever she seems to, whatever she's interested in, literally anything, you know, she's really into growing plants these days. Um, I think that's cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So would you get out of bed at 7 a.m. on a Sunday for the opportunity, for an opportunity to get a serving of the world's largest banana split? Who is eating ice cream for breakfast? Nobody. Certainly not me in college. (laughs) So, certainly not me, 36 weeks pregnant. <laughs> so no. So you get up at 7 a.m. You get ready. You get on the bus. You ride an hour to church. And then you go to Sunday school at 930. And then you have church at 1030. And then you get out of church like around noon. And that's when you get the ice cream. So to any IFB pastors listening, this is a tough sell. Like nobody wants to do that. Like I can buy ice cream at the grocery store. I can buy bananas at the grocery store. Also question, how big is the banana that they're making this banana (laughs) split out of? Like seriously, like you can't just call something a banana split if it's just ice cream and bananas because bananas aren't even that good. And if it's like the world's largest ice cream, like... How are they keeping it so that it doesn't melt? Like, I feel like the banana split is like one of those things that's really good in theory, but is actually way more trouble than it's worth. So the world's largest banana split is actually a spring program promotion that I have actually participated in. To be fair, it was for the bus kids, so it was a little bit easier to get a kid excited about that than a, a, a full adult. Yeah, but you don't get to eat the world's largest banana split. You get a serving of the world's. It's just like you can have like a regular scoop of ice cream. Like I think the thing was you get to see the world's largest banana split. Okay, but here's the thing. I got it. Like, So is it like a bunch of ice cream and then just like 20 bananas like cut in half like down the side of it? Or is it like... One banana, like, is cut in half and then, like, way far apart, just, like, on both sides of just, like, a f- ton of no. ice cream. No. So what we did is we actually got, like, a rain gutter, like, you know, like, from your house, but a, a new one, like, a clean new one. Okay. So, like, you, you you get one from Home Depot, clean it out, make sure it's clean. Right. And then we put a line of paper plates, like, overlapping all the way down this rain gutter. Or okay. whatever we use that's that's a similar shape. I'm not 100% sure I was a kid. It's like a trough, basically. Yes, with a line of paper plates down it. And then we put, like, multiple bananas end to end down the middle of the trough. And then we put ice cream 
down the whole thing. And then we went down the whole line with like ready whip and then looks like chocolate sauce and then with sprinkles. So when you pulled the plates apart, it became single servings because there was one banana on each plate. But before you pulled them apart, it was the world's largest banana split. We did it with tacos too. It was really cool. Okay. That actually makes sense though. I'm, yeah. I'm extremely, I'm extremely uh, interested by banana split logistics and food, logi- like giant food logistics in general is uh, greatly appealing to me. See, I just wish we had actually had it certified by Guinness Book of Records because I am obsessed. Um, this is a new thing that I haven't said on the podcast before and that most people don't know about me. I am obsessed with making it into the Guinness Book of World Records one day. I don't know what I'm going to get in the I'm going to get there for. But I have been obsessed since I was a little kid with the idea that I want to be in the Guinness Book of World Records one day. How many golf balls can you swallow? Probably zero. Okay. Well, we'll figure something else out then. Okay. <laughs> so so this is this banana split thing that we've spent way too freaking much time on. This is just one example. Like sometimes the whole program will have an overarching theme, but definitely each Sunday will have an individual theme as well. So the whole program can have a theme and it might be something like Western, like cowboy rodeo themed, like round them up and bring them to Jesus. Um, it could be circus themed. A uh, pirate theme is really popular. Another uh, uh, great example of the IFB's obsession with pirates. Um, it could be a jungle Weird. theme. It could be an under the sea theme. It could be a military theme. It's like prom themes, but kind of church appropriate stuff. Okay, well, my prom theme was A Night to Remember, and it was Titanic-themed. Yeah, so th- they're probably not going to do that. <laughs> um, you wouldn't you wouldn't have a Titanic-themed church service? I would go well, to that. That sounds actually really good. I mean, not the movie Titanic. They might have a Titanic the boat theme. That would be possible. Yeah, but you'd have the choir sing My Heart Will Go On. No, you'd have the choir sing Near My Heart, or Near My God to Thee. Which is the song that the... I don't know what that is. It's a song that the band played when the Titanic was going under, which they actually did put in the movie. Anyway, the thing, the problem with this is, so if it's a jungle theme, clearly, uh, any other place theme, you could have like an around the world theme. And if they do that, there is definitely going to be something that's borderline racist. Um, or just straight up racist. Or just straight up right, borderline racist. If you're lucky, I'm imagine. You know what I'm imagining right now? I'm imagining Jack Scop and a dashiki. <laughs> oh, I've seen that. <laughs> I am. Oh I God! Am like ninety nine percent sure. Oh yeah, because he had that Ghana missions team, so he used to dress up in like Ghana outfits to go on stage. So I'm oh, sure my you God. can find a picture of that somewhere. That's oh, there's so many white people in like traditional african clothing at first baptist church of hammond all the time that's atrocious oh yeah you could i'm sure you can i'm pretty sure remember that video of the viva la vida jack scop that i was telling you about that somebody made yes i'm pretty sure that is one of the pictures in there he's wearing traditional african clothing but i could be wrong he's wearing a dashiki i don't think he's wearing a dashiki specifically i gotta find i gotta actually watch this video you sent me this video and I like put it on. You watched like part like, of it and then you didn't watch the whole like, thing. I, anyway. I got the general g- gist of it. Yeah. So so anyway, if it's a place theme, they're definitely going to do like Moroccan themed or something. And it's going to be almost racist or like Are they definitely gonna smoke racist. Hookah? No. Okay. Sadly, that would make it so much better. Yeah. No, I would go to church if I could sit in the back and smoke hookah. Anyway. If you do have a theme for like the whole program, then each Sunday has to be a different part of that theme. And there's like a, so many puns involved. Like the puns can get really out of hand. Um, First Baptist Church of Hammond had this one that the theme that was redeeming the time. And this is like back in the 80s. Um, and that's from a Bible verse. But one Sunday they gave a they had like watch Sunday. So they gave an expensive watch, like a like a pretty cheap watch to anybody who brought a visitor and then for this program if you passed a certain milestone like if you brought 25 visitors or whatever when you pass that milestone they gave you like a nice mantle clock and then the grand prize for the person with the most points at the end was a grandfather clock 
Okay, that's weird. Yeah, I mean, it's that was like First Baptist Church's spring program, fall program in the 80s. Okay, like I think, okay, so I think that grandfather clocks are kind of cool. But also, I'm really into watches, so I'm definitely in the minority here. Like, who is going to give up five consecutive Sunday mornings to what sounds like my literal idea of hell in the hopes that they can win a grandfather clock? Well, in the hopes that their family member or coworker or some rando they met on the street can win a grandfather clock. I am, like, I'm trying to imagine, like, somebody knocking on my door and saying, have you heard the good news? And then they say that, I, like, as I'm preparing to slam the door in their face, they shut up. But wait, you could win a <laughs> grandfather clock. But wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more. Like, this is uh, this is just so, like, game show. <laughs> no, I like, don't get it. It really is. Okay, so what if, okay, you're about to slam the door in this person's face, but they tell you that it's Roundup Sunday and there's going to be like, I don't know, a dude doing lasso tricks and that if you stick around after church, your kids can go on a free horseback ride in the church parking lot. Okay, A, that does sound kind of cool, but B, what does cowboys have to do with Jesus? So there is an entire subset of IFB evangelists who are cowboy evangelists who wear cowboy hats and boots. Like, there's one dude who I'm actually pretty close to a couple of his children um, and children-in-law. This one dude actually travels around the country with his whole family, and they, like, play banjos and sing Western songs about Jesus, and they, like, wear a lot of fringe, and they travel with a mini horse. Um, Their family's, like, not the worst. But it, it's, it's not just this one dude, though. There are Christian evangelists who, like, do anything remotely cowboy that you can think of, there's an evangelist for it, like throwing knives or doing lasso tricks or like target shooting tricks or bow and arrow tricks. Like if it could possibly be construed as cowboy, I promise you there's a Christian evangelist for it. Okay. That actually is kind of cool. (laughs) I am not going to lie at all. I'm yeah. So, I mean, I have gotten to see some like cool stuff. There's a, um, Oh, there's a Christian. I mean, there's a Christian drill team too. That one was pretty cool. Huh. I thought dancing was uh, was uh, absolutely trife. I think if it's all men, it's okay. Isn't that is like if it's all men, isn't it gay? Mm, I see. That's a good question. I don't know. See, there we go. That's that's. See, okay. So I am. What if you're a man of great taste and sophistication, such as myself? And your favorite thing is um, in the world is, I don't know, um, race cars. Is there a race car evangelist? So I can't name one, but I am 100% sure that there would have to be one. Uh, because there is there is a Christian evangelist or Christian like IFB group for everything. For everything. Because there's cow okay, there's cowboys. There's a Christian drill team that I saw one year at youth conference and it was like so they did that thing where they like throw the guns and it was like super dramatic. Uh that was a Jack Scott thing. Uh but there's okay, there's a former Harlem Globetrotter who is an IFB evangelist and will like do like Harlem Globetrotter tricks on stage and then tell you about Jesus. There are st- that is kind of cool though. So yeah, that one he's pretty he's pretty chill. I had okay, I had a Harlem Globetrotter come to my high school um when I was in high school and talk about how we should stay off drugs and then he did like a yeah. backflip dunk. It was lit. It was the fucking coolest thing. Yeah, so there was a guy who used to do that kind of thing at, at youth conference because he converted to the IFB after leaving the Globetrotters. He's actually pretty cool. He's he's like not super extreme for the IFB. There are so many like IFB magicians too. Really? Yeah, like there's there are so many IFB evangelists that do like so many different things. I mean, I would think though that like wouldn't the IFB be afraid of magicians summoning demons? I mean, these are Christian magicians, so it's different. So like Jesus? Sort of no, because though so they'll do a trick where they make a flame appear and then they'll talk about how your heart should be on fire for God. And then they specifically don't use magic words because people think that those are secretly spells to summon demons. 
I wish I was making this up, but IFBs really, really, really hate the word abracadabra. Uh, they think it is a, an ancient spell to summon a demon. Really? Yeah, they think it's in the Bible. I, 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 I'll get into it at a later. Okay, day. okay. But like, so it's magicians, it's cowboys, it's yeah. basketball. Okay, yeah. I mean, cowboys are pretty much the only thing. Like, cowboys are the best in the, the world of the IFB. They're the only thing the IFB love more than pirates is cowboys. Interesting. <laughs> so, like, everybody gets to wear jeans to church for that day when you have Cowboy Sunday. Okay. A, oh, so you I don't have to wear your suit. Oh. No. I think this has to do with Roy Rogers. Like, I really think it's because of, like, the the Christian influence of, like, television cowboys. Like, Roy Rogers, um, John Wayne. Yep. Okay. Mm. I think that's where it comes from, but that's just my off-the-wall theory. Uh, a lot of times these themed days for the programs, if it's not cowboys or whatever, it can also be community appreciation days. So you might have police appreciation day or firefighter appreciation day like even like doctor or nurse appreciation sunday or civil servant appreciation sunday so these days would be like if the firefighter if you bring a firefighter to church on firefighter appreciation sunday they would get a gift card to a restaurant and if you're the person who invited them you get double points for the spring program so it it would be something like that so see what I would do, I would have multi billionaire appreciation Sunday. And so if you bring a multi billionaire to church, then you get double points. And then, you know, if you get that back tithe, you'll be set, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I see. Yeah. It makes perfect Okay, so the best part is that you only need one. You just like, but ah man, I feel really sorry for every firefighter in town like because can you imagine like every fire station in town getting absolutely spammed with door-to-door missionaries trying to get double points oh man this might be a place where my perception was kind of warped because i was totally in at the time i always felt like these community appreciation days went over really well our church had a very positive relationship with the local police department and i feel like that was something ifb churches were really encouraged to do just buddy up to local government and buddy up to the police. And I've referenced before that Jack Scott's relationship with the fire marshal helped Hiles Anderson stay out of a lot of trouble at one point because their fire alarm system was totally messed up for like a year and a half while I was there, which is why I kept getting w- woken up by fire alarms at mm. like five in the morning. And all of our listeners who were there in 2011 or 2012 are going to know exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> but at least my church usually had a pretty big turnout for police appreciation day. So I think that like some of these other appreciation days, I think we always had a big turnout, but we were also just giving out gift cards. So I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I am absolutely unsurprised by the fact that the IFB simps so hard for law enforcement. I mean, I think they need to, right? Like there's the very obvious reason that if you have a sexual assault case at your church or involving someone who's on staff at your church or at your school, or if somebody calls the cops on your school because you spank children there, you're going to need to go into that situation from the position of strength of having the local law enforcement, having a good opinion of you and a good relationship with your church. But there's also like the other side of it. If somebody calls the cops because you were knocking on their door (laughs) You have that established relationship with the cops because they know who you are. If you need a little grace period on replacing the fire extinguishers in the church because you can't really afford it, the fire department is more likely to forget to check off on their inspection sheet that you have to replace the fire extinguishers. And the fire department thing also comes in handy because your church or your school might be horrendously over capacity uh, for some services. Or they might just flagrantly disregard ADA requirements and you need somebody who's going to overlook those things. So you're telling me that police enforce laws arbitrarily based on their personal biases and who they have a good relationship with? No, based on what I've seen happen. Yeah, that's what I've seen. Okay, well. So I so I think that the Community Appreciation Sundays make a lot of logical sense because it's good optics. Yeah, among Christian people to like support those groups of people, but it, there's also like a, a 
it behooves you to have a good relationship with the police and the fire department. Yeah, I mean, I could see like a, a Jewish congregation in pretty much any major city showing appreciation for police. But I think that's more to do with the fact that most of them are going to have police or armed private security stationed outside during services because of the high threat of terrorism. IFB churches or Baptist churches don't have to have that same level of security. Like we don't have the danger of terrorism, but in the South and in places where there are really big churches, police have to be at the entrance and the exit of parking lots to direct traffic during church. So there's that benefit as well. Um, There do have to be, so on First Baptist Church of Hammond property, they need cops and private security on the property every Sunday morning just to traffic direct the buses and the cars and get people in and out yeah i don't know it just seems weird to me that you would have themed church services i mean i would think like that the theme of church should be jesus yeah i mean it is kind of weird (laughs) yeah i i wish i had better words to explain this but the vibe is different definitely different on these days it feels like putting on a it feels like having company over like when you're a little kid And where this goes off the rails is I think some of the more extreme promotions that people can throw to get more people to come to church. There are definitely weirder things than Police Appreciation Sunday for sure. Yeah. So we've mentioned this before, like, you know, churches doing a raffle for like an AR-15 or an AK-47 or something, which seemed a bit odd to me. But like, that's not out of the realm of what I expected. But like, what are we talking about? Like really things getting off the rails for promotions so giving away a gun could absolutely happen in an ifb church um, i'm sure that it has oh yeah uh, i'm I'm 100 percent sure it has um the daredevil thing like an evil knievel knockoff dude jumping his motorcycle over a bus in the parking lot after church how would you feel about like a christian daredevil guy so I get so like I get up at seven a.m. I put on my best suit. I get on an old school bus. I go to this church service. <laughs> I sit through this long church service, but at the end, I might get to see a guy dressed as Jesus jump a dirt bike through flaming hoops. Well, okay, not dressed as Jesus because he's probably in like a standard like coverall jumpsuit kind of deal, but it also has a cross on it. <laughs> and he before he jumps, he's going to give a speech about. Jesus and how he might die doing this, but he's going to go to heaven. So here's the question. Is this going to be outside in the parking lot? Almost certainly. Some churches will rent an auditorium with like a large ground floor where that kind of thing can be done or rent a dirt bike track. Or if they're in a city that has a small time racetrack, they might rent that out. But those places can be hard to get on a Sunday and and also it costs money. So it's probably on church property. Then what is to stop me from skipping church, showing up at noon in my car, and watching the daredevil and then going home? This is one of the few promotions that isn't set up to force you to go to church to see it. Most of these promotions, they try to set it up so you would have to be in the service to get whatever it is that they're giving out. So it's like when you agree to go on a free vacation, but then they make you sit through a timeshare sales pitch. Oh, shit. Did you just, okay, okay. Did you just figure out why I get triggered by timeshare pitches? I did not know that you get uh, triggered by timeshare pitches, but that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, that, wow. I, so, sometimes this show is like, th- it's like free therapy. Yeah. <laughs> and and I think I just put together like a major piece of like, oh, that's why I get super really? triggered by timeshares. <laughs> that's really funny. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, that would make a lot of sense. No, you know what this is like? So say we have like a Jim Jones style cult, you know, say we have the Jim Jones cult, the Jonestown, you know, Jim Jones is saying to advisors, you know, his closest inner circle, you know, he's like saying the government's coming. We've got to do this mass suicide. uh, So I've got a bunch of cyanide and I've got a bunch of Kool-Aid. Let's do this thing. And then his advisor looks at him and says like, you know, Jim, I don't think people are going to go for it. And then Jim's like, well, why not? Why don't you think they're going to go for it? They moved all the way out here. And then his visor says, you know, I just don't think people really like Kool-Aid. 
that's what this whole thing is. <laughs> okay, wait. So are you saying like if you drink this Kool-Aid, you can see a guy jump over a bus with a motorcycle? No, 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 no. Like the motor so the motorcycle is the Kool-Aid, the IFB is the cyanide. I'm sorry. I'm trying to make my brain work with your analogy. Okay. But I feel like it's going the wrong direction. Okay, so like nobody nobody wants to join the IFB because IFB life sucks. Right? We know this. You oh. Yeah, you're super you're super broke. Uh you can't do anything and you got to dress all weird. The IFB, yeah, the IFB sucks. The IFB is the sign. Yeah, so like doing a cowboy motorcycle ice cream church service isn't going to make the IFB suck any less. It's uh, just, I, yeah. Oh, I get it now. I get it now. Okay. Yeah. The IFB is the cyanide. The, yeah. The the cowboy motorcycle ice cream church is the cool light. Oh, okay. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Sorry. I mean, honestly, honestly, I am completely baffled that these dumb gimmicks actually help recruit any new church members. Nobody sticks around. Well, then what's the point of having this membership drive? So part of the part of this is that it's not really a membership drive. This is just meant to get big numbers of people saved and numbers of people baptized and people bribed or begged or coerced or tricked into coming to church for just those like four or five weeks. So you have really good numbers that your pastor can brag on at the next pastor school. It's like once in a decade that somebody comes during the spring program as a visitor and actually sticks around and becomes part of the church. It's way it's not really meant to or it's not effective in actually growing your church. What it's effective in doing is boosting morale and exerting control and putting up really big numbers for one or two Sundays in the year. In theory, you're supposed to go out and talk to the people who came as visitors and then try to harass them into becoming church members. But in my experience, that was just long, draining work for very little success. Does it raise any money, though? No. I mean, if anything, these these things, they lose money because somebody has to pay for the prizes. And IFB churches don't even have any money. No, they don't. It's just one of those things How that you do this... because Jack Hiles told you to do it. Who is paying for these like motorcycle jumpers then? I mean, the church budget church budget is, but they're robbing Peter to pay Paul because that's how these that's how most IFB churches function. So they have no mo- like so so they're okay. So they're just spending all of their money on mo- like. But it's one of those things. It's like, okay, this is the same concept as Thursday night soul winning. Thursday night, nighttime soul winning in general, knocking on people's doors at night is not a smart idea. It's not effective. It exhausts your most faithful members and it alienates your less faithful members. But Jack Heil said to do it. So you just keep doing it forever right and i guess you can't be there like if you're out on thursday night like that's like prime time tv the thursday night slot is like the slot pretty sure superstore is on on thursday night i don't know i i i like superstore go ahead (laughs) yeah no but like you know at least during this time you know what was like thursday night tv like that was like the that was like the lineup you know your primo lineup would be thursday night Ah, right. So it's not or basketball is on or something or or there's going to be fo- there's going to be football on on Thursday night. People are going to be home. Right. It's not this this Thursday night soul winning thing like just like the spring program. It's not effective and it's not really intended to be effective in getting people to come to church. It's meant to be effective in controlling the members that you do have and once in a while bringing someone to church. That's wild. Ugh. Yeah, a bit, but it's like it's a th- it's a thing though. Like Heil said, this is the way to build a church with ten thousand members, like I have a church with twenty thousand members, like I have. And this is how you, you do it. This is how you do it. Do what you I just say. Just grind and grind and grind. Okay, wow. I don't know. This whole thing just feels so predatory to me, and so wrong. But 
In honor of the late, great Jack Heil, Sadie and I have decided that we are going to do our own spring program. <laughs> Which will God, I be. Can't, I can't oh, so now Gabby can. feels super um, guilty about even calling it a spring program. I do. No, I do. Because you, you were like, you know what? We should do a membership drive or uh, not a membership. We should do like a. Like a like a promotion. A, are we are we asking? We're essentially we're. <sighs> You know what? I do it every day. I like every time we do an episode, I ask our listeners to recommend our show to other friends. The only difference now is that we're actually offering prizes to people who do it. Right. So like the like the reason we have listeners is because our listeners have recommended us to other people. And as much as we, you know, joke and and, and say stupid things on this podcast, uh we recognize that and we wouldn't be where we are without our listeners we haven't promoted ourselves nearly as effectively as you our listeners have that's true and we're super thankful for you've given us a platform because you like what we're doing and that's extremely validating to us so we are we're going to call it a spring program because it's fun and silly um we are going to have a little contest to see you know for to reward those people who are already promoting us to other people right and so basically the whole idea is that if you recommend us to your friends then we will give you prizes yeah right. instead of the good news of jesus spread the good news of the leaving it leaving eden podcast <laughs> I feel I, I feel so sleazy about this, but also like you know what you're free. But to... people are already doing this. I've seen one of our listeners has posted about us in like three groups this week, and I've seen it. And like I don't think she knows, so I don't think she knows that I'm in the Facebook groups. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she's talking about me all the time. And if you've already done it, then save those. Like sh- save all of the examples oh, yeah. of anything that you've already done because you know we're yeah. So so this contest. Yeah, uh, tell us the rules. The contest will run from the time this episode drops until this time next week. So it's Monday to Monday, one week. And all of this is going to be able to be done from a cell phone. Um, there is no, we are never going to ask you to knock on somebody's door. Unless you want <laughs> and, to. Uh, unless you, yeah, unless you want to. We're never going to tell you to. <laughs> but we're going to, we're going to, you know, let you do it all from your phone because COVID safety and all that. Right. Yeah. Uh, so what what are the rules to this? So here's how you can earn points. If you recommend us to another individual one-on-one, this could be through a text message, through Facebook Messenger, through a postcard, you could send a carrier pigeon, any way that you like to recommend us to another person, you can earn one point for every person that you recommend us to. If you recommend our show in a public forum, like a Facebook group that has people in it, like a subreddit, uh, like on your own Facebook page, if you just make a post about how you like our show, if you make a post on Twitter, if you tweet about how you like our show, any kind of public forum, uh, if you buy a billboard to celebrate how much you love us, any way that you're promoting our podcast. If you get a podcast, billboard, you automatically win. Let's be real. That's true. Yeah. No, any way that you promote us to more than one person at a time, you are, will earn five points. Yeah. Keep track of your points at the end of the week. Send us an email to leavingedenpod at gmail.com and let us know how many points you racked up. Let us know that you recommended us to seven people one-on-one and you posted twice in Facebook groups. So that's 17 points because five points for each post in the Facebook group and one point for each person you recommended us to. Yeah. Oh, also you can... I mean, you can send it to me on social media. Don't send it to Sadie because if you're hearing this, then she has like probably a two week old child and has no yes. time. Yeah. <laughs> if you send it, yeah. If you send it to the email, either one of us will see it. If you send it to social media, I am not going to be on our social medias when this episode drops. So if you're going to send it to social media, send it to my social media. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yes. But uh, but e- either way, we will count up your points and. Um, we will figure out who has the most the most points. Yeah, we're so, not saying that you should go door to door, but no, it can't hurt. But, but we would give points for it. Actually, don't do that. You'll get COVID. Don't do it. But we would give points for it if you did. But please don't do it. Yeah. So, uh, Gavi, would you like to tell our listeners what prizes that our first and second place winner can receive? Yeah. So this is a big announcement for us. Big, big, big announcement. Because 
We now have merchandise available for our fans to purchase. We have two designs. We have shirts and we have mugs. And the two designs are both designs that you can see on our social media. So our Instagram, um, yeah, if you go on to our Instagram, you'll see the two designs. We have, uh, they're both available as shirt or mug. Uh, So the two designs we have are one, Pastor Jack's Texas style poison, um, which I guess was like the poison brand. It was, it was a joke I made, and it then was Sadie a joke wanted and it. And then I a, just loved it, and I wanted it as a T-shirt. She gave me a bottle of cognac for Christmas that had that label on it. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the second one that we have is a a Mountain Moo logo. Yes. So. So really, it's just one thing that I love, and it's one thing that you love. I don't love Mountain Moo. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure you do. You mentioned it on literally. I, I love talking about it's the funniest thing. Okay. So the winner. Okay, so the winner, uh, the second place uh, uh, person in this contest gets any piece of merch that they want. We'll send it to you for free. Uh. The winner of this contest not only gets any piece of merch that they want, but they also get to hang out with us on a video call, which will uh, occur sometime in the future at your own convenience. That's going to be and that's going to be fun. If you have any questions that you want to ask us or if you just want to hang out with the two of us for 30 minutes to an hour. Yes. For fun, because we're fun. Uh, Also, I have an announcement uh, about how committed I am to the fans of the show. Oh, you do? Yes, I do. Okay. In fact, I am so committed to our fans that, well, as you remember, I said in the Facebook group that (laughs) when we got to 2,000 downloads in a week, I would drink a glass of Mountain Moo on Instagram Live. And we, uh, unfortunately for me, got to (laughs) 2,000 downloads in a week. So I'm going to have to be drinking that glass of Mountain Moo and I am going to drink it on Instagram Live this Saturday. So check social media for the specific time. But it will happen. And that's in promotion of our spring program. You know, rather than having me or Sadie take a pie in the face, it's going to be me drinking a glass of Mountain Moo. And obviously, we're recording this episode a few weeks in advance because by the time that this airs, I will have a baby but I'm really hoping that I can be on that Instagram live. I might just be able to be on there for a couple minutes. I'm not sure how how yeah. brand my baby will be. But I I am so ready to see you drink that Mountain Moo. So that'll probably be the only social media that I do. We're right going to announce the winners over social media. We're not going to announce them on uh, on an episode because all of these episodes are way pre-recorded. So yeah, I want to not have to record an episode for a couple weeks but you're gonna drink some mountain moo on on instagram live and that's for everybody and uh i'm pretty excited about getting to see that do you think that mountain moo would be a good tiktok challenge i mean i think it would okay so i'll drink mountain moo on ig live and then i'll make it into a tiktok and put it onto the podcast tiktok um yeah. And we will all be looking forward to that very yeah. much. Okay. And on that note, I think it's time for us to wrap up this week's episode. Uh, do you have anything else that you want to say? No, this one has been a real roller coaster. It's been something. Childhood trauma, Christian cowboys. My gosh. Yeah. Oh, uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, next week in part two of our spring program episode, uh, we are going to talk about some of the wildest themed days that I've seen. We're going to tell one of my absolute favorite um, IFB stories in general. And then uh, we're also going to talk about the big day. And what is a big day? Okay, then. Well, you'll just have to tune in for that one. And there's it's- less childhood trauma in the next one. <laughs> it's going to be really good. Uh, we promise. Uh, so until then, you can find our podcast on uh, Facebook, Instagram, um, at uh, and uh tiktok at leaving eden podcast and on twitter at leaving eden pod sadie do you want to plug your social uh yep you can follow me on instagram at sadie carpenter music or on twitter at hell yes sadie or on tiktok at sadie carpenter one 
All right, then. And you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Clubhouse, all of them the same at G-A-V-R-I-E-L-H-A-C-O-H-E-N. And until next time, uh, we hope you guys have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thankful I decided to change